Um, and we are thrilled to host today a workshop um, led by Dr. Stacy Jacoy, who is a, an associate professor of musicology and also associate director of graduate studies in the School of Music. She is a recipient of our Scubanac Faculty Development Scholarship, and this presentation today is um, part of a series called Commitment to Teach um, that is co-hosted by the, or co-sponsored by the TLPDC and the Teaching Academy. So we are so excited to hear um, your perspective on historic mysteries in the classroom. Um, and we'll turn things over to you, Dr. Jacoy, thank you. Thank you so much, um, so much on this, uh, you know, early post-election Wednesday morning and everybody's got their large cups of coffee and been up late. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for coming. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do the share if that's all right. Um, go ahead and do that. Yeah, you're a co-host, so you should be able to do that, no problem. Okay, and uh, whoa, I got me way over there. Okay, excellent. Uh, and um, let me just do the slideshow. Present. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, let me start off by saying that I uh, would first like to thank uh, the Lawrence Kuvanak Award um, for the opportunity to attend the Humanities Education and Research Association Annual Conference this last spring. The mission of the organization is to promote the worldwide study, teaching and understanding of the humanities across a range of disciplines and to provide additional forums for the exchange of ideas regarding humanities, education in schools, colleges, and universities, libraries, and museums, and other contexts. We met at the amazing and historical, um, whoops, come on, advance. There we go. The, uh, the amazing and historical Palmer House Hotel, which is over here in the corner. It was just glorious in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and had three days of exciting and innovative discussion uh, about teaching and educational practices across the arts and humanities. So this was, was absolutely um, amazing and beautiful historic hotel. Um, so that, uh, that was first and, and really exciting because uh, I met some wonderful people there who uh, also invited me to join some other forums um, that I've been able to be a part of, some of which were canceled because of COVID. And this of course was one of the last conferences I went to before everything went into lockdown. So, um, but I've been to wonderful conferences online since then. So moving on. Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, important figure, of course, in, in, in American history and educational history, says that schools have their indispensable office to teach elements, but they can only highly serve us when they aim not to drill, but to create. When they gather from far every ray of various genius to their hospitable halls and by the concentrated fires set the hearts of their youth on flame. And so, I think this is an amazingly true sentiment, not only in 1837, but today as well. Um, what, however, will set the hearts of our youth aflame? What combination of tools, techniques, and solid teaching skills can we use? What new technologies can be usefully integrated to bring our teaching to life for our students? It is a question that many educators face when they start as young teachers and professors, or even more seasoned teachers at the beginning of a new and maybe completely online semester? The ideas presented here are one possible answer to this question. So my field, I'm a musicologist, um, also considered to be a music historian. Uh, and so let me just introduce you to Mr. Jeremiah Clark. Now, Mr. Jeremiah Clark, as you see here, uh, dates 1674, 1707, um, is not largely considered within the greater canon of music or cultural studies. However, you do know some of his music, all right? And let me just prove that to you. Okay, 
Excellent. All right. So um, like many famous composers of his day, Clark was known to have studied at the Chapel Royale. He held positions um, at the Chapel Royale as well as at St. Paul's, which you just saw there. Um, and uh, Clark was also known to have composed music for the London Theater, uh, including that march that you just heard, that very famous march. Um, and uh, it was, um, he, he wrote for so many different amazing uh, productions during his day. But what you probably didn't know about Clark, even if you already knew about his music, is that early in December of 1707, he supposedly committed suicide. What would then come down to us as one of the most infamous suicides in all of music history? The story of his end told by 18th century music historian John Hawkins uh, and Charles Burney is very romantic. They relate that he cherished a hopeless passion for a lady of high position. Falling into a state of melancholy, he resolved to kill himself. While riding near London, he went into a field where there was a pond and he tossed up a coin to decide whether he should drown or shoot himself. I'm sorry, these are horribly melancholy things, but um, the coin fell with its edge embedded in the mud. So Clark returned to London where after a short time, supposedly again, he committed suicide by shooting himself um, in his house in St. Paul's church side. Okay, so that's the story and that's what's come down to us. The popularity of this story took on a life of its own, becoming a standard addition to many collections of grisly events, last good nights, murders, and other exciting scandals that began to proliferate in the mid 18th century. So all sorts of, of you know, sort of true crime and other um, types of stories that came out at the time. So case closed, or is it? Right, so. Contemporary documents differ with regard to the time and date and other important details of Clark's death. Forensics certainly didn't exist and so-called eyewitnesses were taken at face value. Perhaps there is an opening here for modern reinvestigation of a 300 year old cold case. While this interests me as a historical musicologist, I also pondered the use of Clark's unfortunate demise as a pedagogical tool, a larger historical question that might spur the interest of my large scale undergraduate class. Framed thus as a murder mystery, I crafted a number of questions and clues calling the game 13, both for its ominous quality, as well as the practicality of offering 13 sets of, um, of clues within a 15 week semester culminating in a short research paper where the students had a very open-ended opportunity to say which they thought was the most likely possibility. In the remainder of this presentation, I will detail both the ideas behind the method of the game itself, as well as some of the most intriguing results that I and my students discovered in the course of now three iterations of this immersive game. So gaming and the uses of gaming um, in the classroom, particularly those that implement video or digital technologies have been the topic of academic discussion for now several decades. Considerations have included the macro cause, um, the, the macro uh, using games as a paradigm for the entire class. And of course the micro cosmic side, employing games only once or twice for specific exercises and many variations in between. While the former is certainly an engaging idea to design your entire class as a game, most educators lean toward the latter usage, enjoying games within a more traditionally structured curriculum. The question intrigued me as to how one might best use these game models, apparently so important and appealing to our digital native students in a meaningful way. Interest in large scale games, especially murder mysteries and treasure hunts has been growing in recent years amongst the general public. Think about all the escape rooms that are popping up all over the country. The possibilities of using both physical, technological, GPS devices and online resources has widened and complicated the playing field to the point of stretching the perceptions of reality as seen um, by a very popular group out in California, uh, the Jejun Institute. Um, who created a game in San Francisco in California by, um, by enter, well, an entertaining design for anyone who wanted to be part of it. Uh, and it was called uh, Nonchalance. 
was their design company. And their model engaged a wide swath of the general public with various technologies and intriguing clues that prompted both participation and almost a kind of fan-like interest. Um, also, if you've been to something like Meow Wolf in uh, New Mexico, you've also experienced something like this, where the idea is there's a mystery. Can you solve it? Or do you just enjoy the clues and the process? So using some of these techniques in conjunction with online course-based materials has shown great promise in my classes. Framing this exercise as immersive game that works toward a multipartite solution of a hypothetical content-based mystery takes advantage of innate human curiosity and again, our, our gen, um, student generation's expertise with games and gaming technologies. Um, educators uh, have persuasively argued for the integration of gaming techniques, uh, even an entire class framework, as I mentioned before. Um, but my model does not employ the concept in every aspect of the course but it is integrated into the narrative of the course on a weekly basis, as students are asked to use clues and discipline specific online research databases to solve a set of interrelated problems. Um, and the progressive clues delivered through a mixture of face-to-face -face contact, um, although this semester it's all been online, of course, um, online material delivery, QR codes, smartphone and tablet applications, including Scavenger and Orasma, um, feature um, foster a positive element of surprise that engages students on multiple levels. Student teams, also sometimes in breakout rooms, are challenged to use critical thinking skills both inside and outside of the classroom over the entirety of the semester, which heightens the level of scrutiny of the online materials. And in the end, it is more often about solving the multipartite mystery than it is about any sort of promised prize they might receive. In this presentation, again, I argue that the incorporation of these things creates a more engaging atmosphere uh, for learners, especially when, when it's not seen as a gimmick, when it's seen as something that really is part of the integrated quality of the class. So, and these, by the way, are just some of the uh, databases that were involved in this process. So, Getting to process. Normal problem-based learning processes are advanced teaching techniques that present complex real-world problems to students. Something like diagnose this patient or explain why this building survived an earthquake. These are complicated multipartite problems. This can work well for upper level graduate students, but this may be daunting for younger students who are newer to researching and problem solving in a given field. As a professional in your area, uh, as, a, as a teacher or professional, you know where you would start. Communicating that to students though can be challenging. And so I found that working first through larger who, what, when, where, why, and how questions is um, an immediate doorway into some of these, these types of questions that we can ask. My further concern, as I mentioned, was um, that students were unaware of area-specific research resources, especially the ones in our library. I decided that uh, one way to help set this up would be to connect my questions to the resources as a way to familiarize students with both the kinds of questions to ask, as well as the sources that would help them to answer those questions. This had the effect of pushing them in a way into the deep end of the pool, a challenge of navigating an unfamiliar resource while thinking about an unfamiliar question. But most actually found this to be a really exciting challenge, especially in the framework of the game. So the process begins in the first week. Uh, in this case, the course um, of mine is a music history course. Uh, so introducing a historical figure and quickly summarizing his achievements, in this case, Jeremiah Clark, as you already met, um, was not out of place for my class. This could of course be easily adapted to other types of courses. Students' attention is shifted immediately, however, in this case from his life to his death and the murder mystery begins. Using a combination of in-class prompts, 
online questions delivered via our university's academic delivery medium, Blackboard. The students work through a series of exercises each week that walk them through the scholarly process using professional research resources, identifying relevant evidence, analyzing the evidence, and working toward a hypothesis. Um, when we were face-to-face, -face, we did this oftentimes through small uh, group work in the classroom. Online, we do this through the flexible break room processes that are available through Zoom and other online resources. Um, I have some uh, access to TAs, and so I have asked them to help facilitate some of these uh, and moving around from different rooms. However, this is primarily student-centered learning. They are working in teams to help themselves work through um, work through the idea of the clues with, with very little um, input or rather very little pushing from me. I'm not trying to tell them the answers. I'm not even necessarily trying to say um, anything overt about the resource, except that it is in our library. It's part of the resources that we would usually use for real world problems. Uh, and that these are in many cases, things that they should be familiarizing themselves with. So um, there also is the sort of added fun of something similar to Pokemon Go where they get to use QR codes and other things that are scattered um, around the building in normal face-to-face -face semesters, but also you can place them around your websites or around your Blackboard sites. Um, as sort of an added way to create almost like Easter eggs, if you remember those from, you know, DVD lingo ages ago, <laughs> right? So, um, all right. So along the way, students get points and prizes to help keep interest from flagging and their weekly answers are logged in a game sheet provided um, in this case by me. Uh, if they choose to work through all of the clues in this game sheet, it reveals the final prize uh, which uh, was or has been um, a party. Although we also have this wonderful little video that I'm gonna show to you uh, momentarily. So quickly, um, I know I don't have a lot of time left here. Uh, so here's just a picture of the basic look of the website. Um, again, it's very simple. Um, it just walks them through different clues. So this one in particular was week six and then they, they jump between the website here that I've created um, on a basic free website creator. And then that interacts back and forth and links to Blackboard and their answers and their points are logged. Um, and these, by the way, are just some of the types of uh, resources. I mean, Scavenger connects with GPS, helps guide you around physical spaces. Erasma is uh, really cool. It's got a kind of augmented reality aspect to it. So you can turn anything into a QR code, uh, which can be actually kind of fun. And so their uh, motto or their, their gimmick is bring the page to life right, bring this page. And so anything you want then becomes uh, perhaps, you know, a website or an interactive video to work with with your students. So um, for my students, and I'll just jump right over to one of the pages here if I can, hello. Uh, I just wanted to go here. Okay, so I started mine off with a basic dictionary in our field that I know our students, and it's online, that my students were unfamiliar with uh, because usually they go straight to Google. And Google is a great resource, but we want them to know some of the ones that are more specific to our field. They're already paying for them. They're already in the library. So I send them straight to some of the major ones that they should already know, but in many cases don't. So we start off with Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians. Then I have them compare that back and forth to Wikipedia to show them how the one from Grove's in many cases is, is quite superior to what they would get through an otherwise free source in this case. Um, they compare those things and ask questions about the, um, the, the articles in those two resources. Uh, then they, they head off to 18th century collections online and start getting um, familiarized with primary resources right away, straight out of the gate, because there are some amazing um, things in there uh, that apply to this specific mystery. 
They then go to the classical music library and hear some recordings of his music, which they're asked to compare to some of his contemporaries. Uh, and this gets into questions of possible motivation because, um, because if our gentleman, our Mr. Clark may have been murdered, why? Was he murdered? Forensics didn't really exist in 1707, so we don't have these questions in the contemporary literature, but the clues exist. So who did he work with? Where did he work? Why is, you know, he um, actually supposedly buried in three different places, right? We have all sorts of different questions from the period. And so they jump through a bunch of different resources. They also go to the Smithsonian. They go to the virtual St. Paul's Churchyard Project, which is amazing. They go to Art Store. They go to Rhythm. They go to the National Portrait Gallery. So, um, oh, and the Peerage website. Can't forget that. All right. So, and the Dictionary of National Biography. Okay. So, in the process of learning this, they're actually learning a lot of these resources. And this is wonderful because I've had students come up to me after and say, you know, I really got into this game. I thought it was lots of fun. But what I realized is that it made it a lot easier to write papers in other classes. And I said, that's wonderful. You just discovered the real mystery, <laughs> right? So, Although initial participation was low, just about 15% of the class, because I made it optional the first time, the numbers and interest increased throughout the semester as more students heard their student colleagues talking about the game and something that they had learned from it in class. Time spent in class mentioning both the game and some of the tools employed in it, primary research resources, was a critical element to its success. This functioned interactively with the online components, especially the more novel elements of the game to intrigue some members of the class to participate. Students who participated scored highly in other areas of the course, but reported in anonymous um, final surveys that their familiarity with professional resources, as I just mentioned, that they would have otherwise avoided was much higher and that this assisted them not only in this class, but in others. So traditionally, this class, mine, is a large enrollment required course that covers an enormous amount of unfamiliar and largely unpopular material. It has had a low participation rate. An attempt to find a way to engage students across the entirety of the course in an organic fashion was the object of designing this exercise. Having now used this semester long uh, exercise three times, my initial results indicate that younger digital native students, sometimes jaded to more traditional forms of technology in the classroom, have responded well to this somewhat untraditional method. Mr. Jeremiah Clark's unfortunate demise under the scrutiny of my students, his end has alternately been seen as the object of his own passions and possibly those of others, including most notably his colleague, William Croft, and even Clark's sister, both of whom had motive to kill him. Uh, the latter is a possibility which we have humorously commemorated in this concluding video. And so you see um, the, the team that finishes and wins gets this clue and they jump to this page that you're seeing here. Um, and after they click on it and get it to start, they get this video. Hello, I'm Jeremiah Clark, the organist at St. Paul's, yes, that St. Paul's, and the Chapel Royale. I've been feeling down as of late almost to the point of laying violent hands upon myself. It would seem that my dearest Elizabeth, oh, here she is, is betrothed to someone a much more higher up for me. But in the end, it's not worth killing myself over. What an insufferable fop. Thanks for playing 13. <laughs> anyway, so um, those were my TAs uh, at the time and they were really great sports about it. Uh, and the students loved it. They made student ca they made screen captures and stuck them all over the building. Uh, <laughs> but um, just to finish up, 
I think it's imperative, regardless of our teaching style or our classroom situation, to be proactive, to change traditions and expectations. Because as was said earlier, our mission as educators has in many ways shifted. We must engage students and help them to develop the critical thinking skills that will allow them to have discernment, to deal with the onslaught, or as one of my colleagues has called it, the fire hose of information that they both willingly and unwillingly consume. Can we create environments that interact with technology rather than banning it from the classroom? Yes, but rather than actively trying to stop students from straying through a variety of technological or punitive measures, we need to make the information and the exercises pertinent enough that students will not want to stray and that they might even enjoy it along the way. So the closer we can bring the classroom to a joined perspective of the real world, the better for both our students and our world. And this, I believe, is one method towards setting the hearts of our youth aflame. Thank you very much. Stacey, there are so many amazing things about this, the motivation, the interest, um, and the choice element are some things that really stuck out to me. Also, just the win-win of connecting students to resources that, as you said, they probably should be using, but may not be their go-to. Um, uh, gosh, I, I love hearing about this project. I want everyone who may be watching to know that in the chat, there's a link to um, a presentation that our colleague here at the TLPDC, Erica Brooks Hurst, did um, hosted about using Blackboard breakout rooms um, mm -hmm. because you've suggested using those. Um, and there are some who may have limited familiarity with how to do that. So um, if you're interested in doing something like this or setting up a different you know, strategy activity where you want to work in smaller groups, um, I think that would that might be a great resource. Um, I so enjoyed hearing about this. And I um, um, props to your TAs as well. <laughs> they did a beautiful job at the end. <laughs> Yeah, yeah we, we did that in one take. We were excited. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for, for being willing to present this today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I um I, I really just want to stress that, you know, several people have come to me when they've when they've heard me talk about this because I just get really excited and I want to talk about it more mm -hmm. uh, and and um, say, oh, wow, you're so creative. Wow. You know, and it's like, no, that's not the takeaway. <laughs> the takeaway is that, you know, we as professionals in whatever field we're in, whether it's architecture or, or social sciences, anthropology, STEM, whatever, we have professional problems and we know that to deal with them, it takes a lot of different thought. And as mm -hmm. professionals, we know that we just already zip to those answers. And so of course we try our, our best always to make sure that our students understand those processes. But a lot of times teaching methodology can be methodical. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've noticed in the past, and I'm sure many others have as well, that when you get to those days where you know, okay, well, today I'm going to have to teach databases and resources, mm -hmm. and you're like, wow, this is going to be great. <laughs> right? You know, um, and so that that became part of this impetus to say, all right, mm -hmm. how can we make this more fun? How can we make this more integrated? Mm -hmm. Rather than just saying, you should learn about Echo, which is the 18th century resources online. You should learn about, this is what it does. It's so great. You know? um, yeah. Instead, I end up making them read an 18th century newspaper right out of the gate. And I don't even tell them that the answer's on the last page because I'm mean. So, yeah. uh, you know, but then they end up like working their way through it and realizing, hey, this is a totally different world. And look at all of these amazing resources that are just right here. And mm -hmm. so and I'm sure other faculty and instructors really appreciate you introducing students to these resources in advance of their, their courses. So it's, it's a win, win, win all the way around. <laughs> That's the hope. And again, my classes, as I said before, are usually either freshmen or sophomores. So, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure it's clear to them that, that undergraduate research is not out of their reach, even in their very first year, even, you know, in their lower level, lower level classes. 
uh, you know, and, uh, you know, strong proponents in undergraduate research because which is one of the big goals for the university too. So win, 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 win. <laughs> so anyway, we but, certainly appreciate it, Dr. Jacoy. Thank you. Thank you.